Report. The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Aloha, body. Body. Uh, Hello. Sorry about that. No, no worries. worries. How's it I was going? like, is it us again? <laughs> <laughs> it's always nope, us. No, no, it's, it's me. <laughs> How's it going? You know, y'all guys were y'all were talking about how difficult it is and how y'all are juggling all this stuff, and you're like, you know, please forgive us. Honestly, from an outsider perspective, everything looks great. Everything looks polished. Like if y'all are having all kinds of crazy, you know, stuff in the background <laughs> that we don't see, we just don't see it. Like everything looks really nice from the front end. So just oh, okay. just wanted to put that in your ear. Thank you. Oh, that's Matt. that's sweet. That's Thank you. That, that that helps a lot. We appreciate you you lying. For us. <laughs> <laughs> it's de- definitely not a lie. Y'all are saying it, and I was like, "What are they talking about?" Everything looks <laughs> like sometimes you're a few minutes late. Oh my god. <laughs> well, sometimes our audio or like our camera, like it was giving me issues before. It's, yeah, it's I guess, my I laptop. Guess it's more behind the scenes. Yeah, it's like the laptop and the lagging, yeah. and then I freak out because you know it's annoying, but. I mean, you know, we do what we can, but thank you. That makes me feel better. And, that, and now, and now we have nuts. Body as part of the show, I bringing know. in the, the price report. Woohoo! <laughs> you, you, you've yeah, take, took me. up a notch, man. You've taken it up a notch. We appreciate it. <laughs> well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I don't know how many notches I could take it up today, though. Everything is <laughs> everything looks lovely. You know, price is going up. Everyone's happy. Although, uh, I'll show you one thing that happened last night again. So remember the last, so last Friday, Price had taken this massive pump on, uh, you know, like at the end, after the close of business. And then in the middle of the night, like right around, I don't know, 4 or 5 a.m., they pumped the price and then it came right back down. Well, they did it again, the exact same thing uh, last night. They pumped the price up by, what is that? I guess it's only 5, 5%, but still, they kind of pumped it overnight and then dropped back down. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever. It's, you can't really complain about gains. So... Um, we, we have this like very volatile price action, and that was kind of one of the things I said a few weeks ago. You asked me if we were going to keep up with Bitcoin price. My theory was that yes, but with significant volatility, uh, because behind the scenes, you know, they'll they'll push these like blow off tops and then they'll they'll use that to try and uh, delay. Like so they I think that this all of this right here was largely market makers, maybe Binance or whoever in the background. They kind of cause this big parabola and then they use that on the back end to try and push price down later. And it comes back to ultimately it comes back to even, uh, but it creates this volatility and it kind of distracts interest. And people say, oh, look, there's other coins, other shiny coins that are getting gains. Monero is just kind of like flat and not doing anything. Uh, so it's in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a psychological game, if you ask me. But the important thing is that here's our trend line. Like this is our overall trend line. And that's the one that we want to keep overall. We want to we want to keep going up, uh, no matter this induced volatility to the downside. So again, everything's still looking pretty good, uh, except for eh, Bitcoin versus or XMR versus BTC is not as nice as we would like. Uh, let's see. Just wanted to go to the big view here before we move on from Monero US dollar. Ultimately, we're pressing up against the longer term uh, this trend line right here. And eventually that should break. Uh, this is normally how you break trends line, trend lines, right? You'll come up, you'll take a dip, you'll come right back up to it. The S&P 500 looks kind of similar. And eventually we should break this to the upside. Um, and then we'll go over to XMR BTC. And you see we've basically broken down from this nice trend line that we've had since uh, since last year, uh, started starting right around April. So again, this is kind of induced volatility. This is largely the result of market makers really pushing Bitcoin. They push Bitcoin significantly higher than the other coins. Uh, it's my it's my opinion that they're trying to put the chart set up in such a way that inspires confidence. There's there's a lot that goes into this, but essentially, when you have a situation where things are looking bad and everyone's fearful, and we have all the permables that are now saying, oh, wait, it's going to go lower. I'm, I'm ready for it to go lower. And they're even praying that it goes lower because they want to they want a DCA at a much lower price. They finally accepted that we're in a bear market, which is, again, another that's another indicator that we're probably reversing. But the point is that you need to take the negative sentiment and you need to convert that into positive sentiment. And you do that by putting a chart set up, by painting a chart set up that looks nice. And the reason they need to do that is because so much fiat has left the system that they need to get that fiat back into the crypto system. If you go to stable coins, generally speaking, that money is still sloshing around the crypto ecosystem overall. 
but they need to get actual fiat investment back into the crypto ecosystem because they don't they can't just push price as far as they want forever right market makers can push price they can take temporary losses even to push that price that they need to but ultimately they need real people and organic investment to support that price so they have a lot of control but they're not uh, they're not like crypto gods they're not you know they're not gods of the market they uh, they do depend on organic retail action and uh, it's kind of like a dance right you've got them kind of leading the way you've got retail kind of following but retail is still very important to this whole price dance so they've pushed bitcoin significantly which is what this is right here uh it's kind of sad to see us breaking down but i mean come on we're sitting here at zero zero seven four zero zero seven five right so we're sitting at double oh seven numbers right now and that's not bad if we go back, let's maybe expand the time horizon a little bit. We can see that basically 006 is, it, that's basically our floor. That's really where our floor should have been until they started up the crypto fraud machine and and, and caused all this to happen down here. Uh, but that's fine. You know, let them do that. Monero continues being awesome. We continue developing. I say we, I <laughs> mean uh, our developers, obviously. Uh, those are the guys that really make everything happen. So Everything is still fine. We're still sitting at levels that are reasonably okay. Um, and there's, I mean, there's always still a good chance, again, that this will have volatility. At some point, the crypto market will pull back. And because they're out of Monero, they can't just slam the price down continually. One thing that did happen, um, and that I, I wish I had maybe done a better job of saying out in, in real time, was so we saw all of this action right here where the exchanges were acquiring Monero. They, they had diverged their prices upwards. They, were, they did volume up at those levels. And there was just a couple bit of these guys right here. But overall, they had acquired a, a pretty decent stack as Monero's price started to go more and more parabolic, right, as that curve up happened. And then they've it's my guess that they've been able to use that Monero when we did that little consolidation. So for the last week, it's basically been consolidation for most cryptocurrencies. So... The Monero that they acquired, it's my guess that they use that to create, induce this volatility, right? So they kind of push things up. They diverge their prices up. That helps the Monero price. And then ultimately, they dump that again back on the market and create this volatility. So, but this is good. This is, well, maybe not good, but this is better than the situation we were in at the start of the bull market uh, right here, where they actually had a significant amount of Monero still on the exchanges. And what they could do was keep meeting withdrawals while pushing the price lower and lower because at the time it didn't seem like there was anything wrong right they're meeting withdrawals you know are they are they fractionally reserved we don't know no one really knew for sure and so they were able to push these these large price divergences again that's why i don't think they're going to be able to do what they did down here they're not going to be able to do that again they'll, they'll be able to play with it right they'll be able to, maybe they can push us down to 006 whatever but overall i, I do believe that monero is going to spend a lot of time just going sideways versus Bitcoin. Kind of like I said uh, a couple weeks ago, we could need to do some consolidation for a large part of this year, but ultimately there is a good chance this chart does break to the upside. Um, we'll see. We'll see when that happens. So recently we had some positive price divergences again. Um, so hopefully that continues. Uh, it's nice that the exchanges are keeping their doors open for Monero. That's, that's good. That's important. Uh, huh. Okay. My chart seems to have frozen just a little bit. Uh, all right, well, that's okay. We were about done with Monero anyways. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the overall crypto market. So if you remember a couple weeks ago, I was talking about this very big line right here uh, that started back in 2015. And I was saying that we might have a hard time getting above this line uh, in the future. That, that line might be a significant overhead resistance. We're basically sitting at that resistance right now. Uh, this would kind of tend to contradict my notion that we're going into a larger sustained bull market for this year, because I do feel like, like we said a second ago, we do need price to kind of continue going up here, get into some positive territory so that we can fall back and then hold this current area as support. So it's easier to see if we go down to the smaller time frame. Okay, so this is overall the, the bear market since summer of last year. And you can kind of see that we've got this this area right here that's uh, eventually broke down. And you can see also that area right there. It's got the dotted lines. So the idea being that this acted as a trend line for a while, and then it would act as resistance. 
if you want to paint a bullish setup, and I do think that the market makers and the exchanges want to paint that setup, we do need to continue breaking to the upside. We need to get to some like very obvious resistance point, like right here maybe, so that we can come down and test this area again in maybe a month from now or a few weeks from now. Could could even be it could even start next week, right? Maybe we continue pumping through the weekend and then and then we establish some kind of support. Uh, but at any rate, we want to pump beyond the obvious area that's problematic, maybe even break this, right? Breaking, breaking this area right here, this peak that happened there and getting into this area would really be bullish. Like that really tells people, hey, the market could actually be doing really well. Come up here, test this, establish support and then take off. Uh, take off to where exactly? I couldn't say. I, I did notice that the, let me move this. So this U shape right here, it kind of reminded me of the 2018 of this guy right here they kind of look similar to me so i did a little bit of a pattern overlay called a bars overlay or a fractal people like calling it a fractal because it sounds cool so essentially you have to compress you have to squishify this whole uh this whole fractal a little bit but ultimately it does look very similar and just the intuition that i have about this market and where things are at it feels very similar to the fall of 2021 or maybe the end of summer 2021 it feels very similar to the end of the last bull market it feels similar to the end of the 2015 2014 2015 bull market that's just an intuition that i have about where things are at it's why for this entire week i've kind of been saying hey it looks to me like we should go up here things are positive everyone sort of expects that we're going to fall back down but i i really you know especially <laughs> um a lot of the bears uh, or a lot of the former bulls gone bare, it seemed like they were saying, no, you know, it's going to pull back. This is just a fake out, right? It's like, it seems like we're in the part of the cycle where people say, where people uh, doubt the rally, where people think that it's, uh, that it's not real. So to me, it is real. There really are people buying. I like, for example, if I'm a representative sample of some portion of the population, I've been buying the last few weeks. So I'm sure that there are other people out there buying as well. Uh, we have broken some important resistance lines. And again, this is Bitcoin, Bitcoin USD, right? So the very most easiest, obvious resistance line to draw was just broken as of last night. So this is good. This is exactly the kind of thing that we want to see. If we go to total market cap, you can see the exact same thing happened over here, uh, where that sort of this very upper line right there, uh, that was broken as well. And that was actually broken on the initial run out of this sort of bottom area. So these are all these are all really good signs. This is exactly the kind of thing you need to see. Um, and especially with the way that crypto price tends to move, right? It'll be so often crypto, crypto price can be flat, flat and boring. And then suddenly it'll just do something. Suddenly it'll just pump and then it'll pump, it'll wait, it'll pump again, it'll wait and then it'll pump again. Like that, that just happens so often. This kind of three phase push is a very common thing. We can go over here to the Bitcoin dominance chart and we can see, you know, again, what's been happening for the past past couple months now, especially recently. So this is also a thing that we look at. And we say the market makers, it's a pattern that they do. You have to convince the plebs that Bitcoin is ready to go. If you have a little uh, sorry, if you have a limited amount of cash and you need to throw that somewhere, the most important place to throw it is still Bitcoin. Right. If they want to spend money, they want to pump the price of Bitcoin. They want to establish that Bitcoin is good, that the chart setup is good, that it's going into another bull market. So it makes sense that they would pump the Bitcoin dominance. This is exactly what happens in the entrance to the bull market at the end of 2020. So I guess that's about all we have for crypto. Let's go and take a look at some of the macro stuff. Um, maybe did I want to start there. No, let's start with the stock market. So the stock market had a. We had some interesting dynamics that played into crypto price and the stock price. I was um, so again, this is the same deal where you've got this long bull market, uh, sorry, bear market trend line. And this is exactly how you expect to break these trend lines. You hit it, you hit it again. You don't you don't go all the way to the bottom, but instead you stop early and then you come back up again. I was kind of hoping that we would break this last week. And instead on Wednesday, some of the Fed presidents came out and they talked about, oh, it looks like we probably need to raise the target interest rate. Probably we're going to need to go to five and a half percent instead of five percent. So everyone got scared on Wednesday and they sold. And 
I kind of think of it as market manipulation, to be honest, because those Fed presidents knew exactly what would happen to the market when they came out and said that they were going to probably maybe raise to five and a half percent. It does look to me like they're trying to keep the market in a range. And this is this kind of applies double for crypto. So just understand that we're talking about stocks, but this also applies to crypto as well. So down here in October. So in August at the top of the market, I was saying, guys, this is the top. We're going to go down now. And this is this is probably like a capitulation run. Well, down here at the very bottom, the thing that was important to me is that the only thing that could stop further crashes if central banks came out and intervened. That's exactly what they did. We talked about that back then in real time, how the central banks came out and they, for example, the Bank of England started buying bonds again. At least there was a window where they where they bought bonds. We had the United Nations that was like chastising the Federal Reserve saying, you guys are raising too fast and you're going to cause a global recession, blah, blah, blah. But at any rate, they came in, they opened their mouths, they did just enough action that put a bottom on the market, right? Put a floor down here. So now they kind of come over here to open their mouths to keep us from breaking this line, at least temporarily. So it seems to me that central banks are trying to manage price from dipping too low, having any major crashes, but they also don't want a big rally right here. And it makes sense. Inflation, a significant part of this inflation happening is because everyone had these mad gains on the stock market and everybody's rich now. People don't have to work, right? People are retired. People are professional traders now, et cetera. So they really don't want the markets getting out of hand again. And of course, they cause that and they know what they're doing. These are smart guys. They're, let's, let's be real. They, they know exactly what they're doing. But for the meantime, it seems like they don't want the markets to rally too much. But eh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not sure how much they can do to stop it at this moment unless they just want to go nuclear. So that was Wednesday. We had this crash here. The response to the crash on Thursday, maybe we can go back to crypto charts. Uh, we can zoom in a little bit. I do want to show you a little bit. Yeah, so this right here was Wednesday. Um, was it? No, it wasn't. Here we go. This, Yeah, yeah, this was Wednesday. Okay. So the markets came down on Wednesday and they closed kind of down. But the thing that kept me bullish and had me rebuying positions, so I took just a little bit of profit around this area um, on my, not on Monero. I don't trade Monero except for that, like the one time, but I'll never do that again, I promise. <laughs> so uh, I took a little bit of profit. But anyways, the thing that got me back in the market was was watching this right here. There was a wick down. Things came and stabilized. And if we were going to fall back down, that was the time, right? That was the BART chart opportunity. Um, and if you don't know what a BART chart is, you just take Bart Simpson's haircut and it goes up to the top. It's got these spiky things and then it's, uh, and then it crashes back down. If we were going to BART chart our way back down to the lows, that's where it should have happened and it didn't. So that was important to me and that's what kept me bullish. And, uh, and it, it appears to have been the right move now at this point. Uh, let's go back to stocks. Okay. So what's going to happen? What I think is almost certainly going to happen is we are going to come on this line here. And I don't know exactly how we break it. Maybe we come up and then we come back down and then it goes or, right, maybe it's just like some crazy jump here and then some big volatility or maybe we, we touch it and then we kind of like trend down and then eventually just do that. I don't, I don't know exactly how many opinions on how it breaks, but this, this line, this bear market resistance line looks very much like it's going to break. So that's good. That's good for crypto. It's good for risk. People leverage up. People put money back in the markets. If you're a trader, you need volatility. Uh, that helps you that helps you make money, right? Um, trading is a DJ in game. Most people are going to lose money. So uh, if you're going to trade, at least for the love of God, don't trade leverage. You can know the correct direction of the market and still lose on leverage. This is the NASDAQ. Uh, so you can see, again, as we talked about the other day about how to draw pleb lines, we've got this line right there. And then we've got kind of our other line as well. It gives us a nice zone of where to expect um, where kind of like the zone of resistance is. And that's basically where we're, the area that the NASDAQ is entering. So things still looking good. Things still looking positive overall. Um, if you're, if you're a trader, if you had sold the top of the market last year and you're sitting waiting patiently in cash, my recommendation is you should be acquiring a HODL position right now. Um, you, uh, you, you want a position that you're not going to be trading and selling. Maybe that would be, 50% of your stack, I really recommend it should be at least 50% of your stack, maybe 70 or 80% of your stack is you don't trade it. You might reallocate it a couple times a year, right? That's kind of, that's different from trading. 
So you might not huddle, you know, we might come in a few months to the top or whatever it looks like the top of a nice rally. And then you might say, yeah, things look like they need to pull back here for the next months or six months or something like that. Right. That's not really trading. That's just moving your funds, getting on the right side of the market. Like, OK, we could argue about definitions or whatever. But your trading stack, you might have another position, say 10, 20, 30, or if you're a gambler, 50 percent of your trading stack right now. You want to be acquiring that hodl and then you also want to be long with your trading stack and then somewhere at the next bounce some of the, one of these next pumps will probably say okay it's time to take your trading stack and sell that your hodl stack will still remain in the market because overall the macro position still looks uh, looks bullish everything looks pretty good um we'll talk about the macro and then uh and then that'll be it for this segment so these are the reverse repos and we've got the 100 day bollinger bands this is a one standard deviation bollinger band and I just wanted to show, especially this chart again, in terms of the Bollinger Bands, because it's very hard uh, to use these sometimes correctly. We can look at the overall bull market here. Uh, well, bull market in reverse repos, which is correlated to the bear market and risk assets. So you see, we're basically riding the standard deviation, right? We're trending. This step right here, things kind of roll over and the volatility compresses again. The thing that's important here is that you came back to the standard deviation sorry, to the uh, to the moving average, but you didn't dip all the way down into this zone right here. And you still had this guy that was still trending positively. The underside of this Bollinger Band was still trending upwards, right? So that kind of tells you that you're really just in a cool off phase for a period of time. And then you see things pressing back up against the top of this trend line, and then they just stay there. This area right here, for example, would be a good spot if you're looking to get long this asset, which it's not really, that's not how this asset works, but just from a chart, pure charting perspective, you would expect that right around this area, you would start expecting that you're going to actually keep going up. Um, but then what happens here is you get the rollover of this Bollinger Band, the top flattens out, the bottom flattens out, and you kind of come back down to the lower standard deviation down there. So that's um, that's like, that's important price dynamics or chart dynamics in general. So when that happens, and then you kind of you come revisit this the moving average area. When this spike happens up here, you look at that and you say, no, 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 that's fake. That's not real. The the Bollinger Bands, the standard deviation, the volatility has already rolled over and you're just spiking up through that range. It's kind of a, it's an exhaustion wick. It's a fake out. So we're now starting to trend down to the underside of these bands here. And this is starting to have negative curvature to it. So this is the kind of signs that we'd be looking for that the reverse repos would now be in a little bear market, right? Where they would now start coming to the bottom of this, this megaphone and then probably at some point drop down below. And again, this is correlated to institutions that have money just parked with the Federal Reserve overnight getting, if, I think it's like four and a quarter percent annually overall divided, you know, divided by 365 days. So this is institutional money that could get redeployed to other places risk in the market. So if, if you have institutions that are buying, that's just good overall in, in terms for making gains, right? Uh, oh, bonds and interesting things. Oh, you know, before I forget, I'm going to forget if I don't say it right now. Sorry to be schizophrenic here. Um, Genesis. Did I pull that up? Uh, here we go. Genesis, which is a part of DCG. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of DCG. They filed for Chapter 11 on I think it was either Thursday night or Friday morning, yesterday morning. So uh, the Winklevoss Gemini is owed $800 million by Barry Silbert and Genesis. And of course, Genesis is owed money by FTX. One thing that I said back in November after the FTX collapse, I said that the moment we start seeing new bankruptcies, significant bankruptcies in cryptocurrency that don't take price down with them, that's a huge sign that we've actually reached the bottom. Well, this is a pretty significant bankruptcy. Genesis officially declared in Chapter 11. And then what happened yesterday? The price pumped anyways. So that's just that's just an important thing for us to keep in mind. Again, it's just it's all these little pieces. This piece, you know, the reverse repos, the way the charts are setting up. Genesis, Genesis declares bankruptcy, but price pumps anyways. Everything about this setup shows us that we're going into a larger rally, a, a significant rally, something more than what we've had for the past 12 months. So uh, that's important to keep in mind. We've got the 10 year yield. And one thing that has happened with the 10 year yield or all the government yields, the action on these has finally normalized. So this is something I realized very recently. 
Um, and it was like, I kind of knew this was happening, but I didn't have like a succinct way of encapsulating it. When yields go up, that's because people are leaving the bond market and they're going into the stock market or risk assets. When yields go down, that means people are leaving stocks and going into bonds. And of course, the mechanism being if a bunch of people are buying bonds, as the issuer of the bond, you don't have to provide a high interest rate, right? There's all these people that want your bonds. You can say, yeah, I'm not going to give you a good interest rate. I, I have 20 other people that want that want a bond, right? But if people leaving your bonds and going somewhere else, you have to be like, oh, wait, no, but I'll offer you more. I'll give you a better interest rate. That's the classic action that happens on yields. But for this bear market, the crypto and stocks bear market, what we saw was a reversal of that. And I think the mechanism is, so the reversal of that mechanism was that yields were going up and stock markets were going down at the same time, which usually that shouldn't happen. I think the mechanism was that there was so much leverage in, in stocks and crypto that as yields started to rise, that leverage has to be serviced. It's, it's based on debt, right? When you take leverage, it's you're borrowing money from somebody else. And that borrowing has a, an associated percentage rate. So as yields went up, the, the interest on the leverage also continued to go up. So it meant that they couldn't keep so much leverage. They had to unwind that. And so I think that's the reason why we saw a temporary reversal of that pattern. As of at least, like, say, the last few weeks or the last month, this is finally normalizing. We're, we're starting to see this action act normally. And I've noticed that particularly as of the last week or so. Uh, so that's nice. We've got, uh, we could just take a look at the overall. Oh, there's my long-term yellow, yellow circle. Like we kind of hit it and then we're, and then we're out. We're not, I don't know if we're going to hit that anymore. Uh, okay. But any, at any rate, this is kind of the long-term look at the 10 year yield in an uptrend, but uh, things are probably flattening out here. If you remember for the new year's episode, we talked about, we, we talked about the very long term. Oh, crap. I was in the logarithmic. I don't know. My charts switch me to logarithmic sometimes when I don't want to be. But anyways, we had talked about, um, right. This was the uh, post World War II, World War II and post World War II era. And, um, and we're kind of like a very similar thing happened where it flattened out and then it started going up and we're kind of going through a similar thing right now. So I don't know. Just something to keep in the back of your mind there. And gold. Oh, yeah. That's right. Last, last thing here. Gold is important uh, because remember we said that gold tends to lead for the last two decades. Gold has led outside, led out of bear markets and out of stagnation. So gold indeed did the kinds of action that we had expected um, out of this rising uh, rising wedge. We're sitting at some pretty important levels, right? This line, you can see the dotted line there. Anything above here, right, in this area is basically just blow off kind of stuff. Um, that's ultimate all time high gold prices. Um, you can see again that the 2011, the top there, we're basically passing that exact same area right now. Gold has just barely gotten above that. So I don't know how much longer this gold run is going to last. I do just because of the momentum and because of the way it has tended to act in the past. I do imagine that it'll probably get a nice blow off here to the top and then it'll come back down. So gold reaching this area here will probably be another big sign that the stocks and everything is ready to go, um, at least on a longer term basis. Uh, and, and also gold reaching here, reaching that top area will probably be a point where you might reallocate some of your if you're if you hold gold, um, you might reallocate some of that into stocks and crypto. And with that, I think I feel like I had one more chart, but maybe I don't. Oh, um, yeah. OK. Yield curve inversion. Uh, sure. Uh, so we've got a full year yield curve inversion still down here. They slightly almost kind of normalized. And you can see here, this is our overall yield uh, curve inversion on the bottom. And then the stair step is the Fed overnight interest rate. Um, one thing that I'm curious about what happens. So let's go to a longer time frame. Historically, we can see that the Fed will like raise rates and then they'll raise rates above the rest of the yield curve. And it's like, <laughs> It was just kind of it's backwards, right? They're the shortest term yield. They should be yielding the less, uh, the least. But so we've seen here that before big crashes where the Federal Reserve actually gets outside of that bound. But like even this right here, that was a two year time frame, right? This was two years before the markets actually crashed. So if we're going to see some other big market crash, the thing I'll be looking for is if these yields all start to just dramatically do that. They just start dramatically dropping. That'll be a sign that the stocks are about to crash. And that's a very quick sign that can happen usually like a week. You might have days to a week to get out of the market 
when you start seeing these major crashes. So, that, but we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So, uh, with that, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you guys today. Do I have any questions? Awesome, man. Um, so, so in summary, I mean, how confident are you that the 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 bottom is in with crypto? Is, is it like eighty percent at this point? Yeah, I would say. Well, at least temporarily. Um, I yeah, I would say it's probably 80, 90 percent confidence right now that we have reached a temporary bottom. We're not going to go back down to those lows. If we do, it'll be like September, October, November. Oh wow! Okay, okay. And then, so how how high? I know you said it, but just to kind of summarize, how high do you th you know predict Bitcoin essentially to go before we see you know a significant pullback? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that question. Yeah. I, uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't have a good answer. Um, so right now, before the first pullback, or like overall? I guess uh, overall. So it's it's hard to say. I was looking at some stuff. People talk about getting back to 50,000. I don't see it. That's just so far to go. I, I don't see it. I do look at this. Oh, sorry. I do look at this area right here. That's significant. I think that getting to those areas would induce a significant pullback. Mm -hmm. um, I think on Twitter, I said that your take profit points should be 23. So right where we're at here, 25 and then 28. Um, those are, those are kind of like my, my trading stack take profit areas will happen at there at those areas. So far I haven't taken any profit because the altcoins are lagging behind and I'm actually have very little Bitcoin, um, which I guess has kind of been a mistake for the past couple of weeks. Um, so Bitcoin might be getting to some resistance areas, but the altcoins are kind of lagging behind. If my altcoins had kept up with Bitcoin, I would have taken some profit from them already. Um, mm. but things still just look so positive. So at the moment, I would say, let it, you know, let it ride. I think it's possible we could get to this area right here. So we could get to like 40,000, 45,000, 50,000 seems like a tall order. Um, but yes, overall, like pretty high confidence that, the overall directionality is up. There's the chart has gone vertical, so it's hard to tell people buy and buy now because you know, for all I know, we could pull back tomorrow. But things still look very positive. Awesome. Yeah, I wasn't aware um, that that exchange had filed for bankruptcy. Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you I filed that closely at all? Is uh. No, I, I just know that DCG owns them. I know that they owe the Winklevoss twins and FTX owes Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is a significant bankruptcy. I don't think it's going to take DCG down. I, I think I don't like Barry Silbert so much, but I, I don't think he's lying that like there. I don't think it's probable that DCG is not like heavily exposed to Genesis. Legally speaking, they're probably segregated so that whatever losses happen for Genesis is separated from DCG. But if, if DCG did go down, I think that'd be a significant blow to crypto, right? I think we'd see a, you know, another kind of like FTX type of moment. What do you think? Yeah, if, if DCG and or Binance died, um, we everything I just said would be wrong. <laughs> we'd be yeah. back at the lows again. Yeah, so there is that to keep in mind. There There is still systemic risk. Crypto, there is no doubt about it. Crypto has systemic risk still. Uh, but... Is, there, is it, it wrong look to be like, rooting for DCG to go down? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm rooting for. I don't, I, I guess not. I mean, overall, their death and Binance death would be good for digital freedom money. It would be yeah. good for the ratio because we've seen what happens to the ratio yeah. when all the fakery and scam coin propped, you know, support mechanisms, once those go down, uh, we get more fairly valued. Exactly. It, it's a pickle. I don't know. I want my gains. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, great analysis as always. Greatly appreciated. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you.